Welcome to the Living Consciously TV show, live from Denver, Colorado, from our studios here. I'm your host and moderator, Coach Steve Toth, and our theme today is how to get off the automatic pilot and get to the real you. Let me introduce our guests, and our guests also our cast. Our guest today is Jim Gillette, and he's joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hi. Glad to be here. Awesome. And uh, next to Jim, to his right, is Ninon de Verde Rosa, and she's our self-growth expert, guest member, and she's joining us from the beautiful city of Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to be here. I've only lived here two weeks, so I'm having a great time. I don't want to know how. The show. I don't want to know how warm it is. <laughs> I <agree. laughs> it's warm. It's lovely. Okay. And uh, next to Ninon, to her right, is Alicia Kramer, and she is our self-growth uh, cast member as well, and she's joining us from Wisconsin, the icebox, right? Hi, everyone. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Alicia. Good to have you. And um, <laughs> last but not least, uh, we have uh, Jane Eileen Cohen um, next to Ninon right now. She's our spirituality cast member, and she's joining us from the beautiful San Diego city out of California. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. Fantastic. So here's the sh how the show is going to go today. So we're going to have four segments. The first segment, we will answer the question, what is the Living Consciously TV show is really about for our first-time viewers? And our second segment, we will talk about, we will actually have a dialogue about what are the issues and problems with not getting off the automatic pilot. In our third segment, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to share with you from our own experiences some of the tools and some of the modalities that have worked for us before um, to assist you to connect to the real you. In our fourth segment, if you have some time left, we will take some calls from our viewers. So let's begin with our first segment, which is what is the Living Consciously TV show is all about? Well, for me, um, I don't want to keep repeating myself and say the same thing, so I want to do something different today. So really, the show is about consciousness, is to show the public what does it look like and what does it feel like to be, to be conscious and, and doing it in, with a group of people because it's easier to do um, by yourself and it's easier to do with another person. But once you take it to another level, which is the level we're at, there is a group involved. And if we can do this as a group, then, you know, a city can do it, a county can do it, <laughs> a whole state, a whole country, the whole world can do it. So that's the purpose of the show. And one more thing I wanted to share with you, which is just coming to me from the movie Matrix, which where, um, you know, you know the, the star of the show is, um, is presented with take the blue pill, or take the red pill. And um, what he took is the red pill. So our, sh our show is a little bit sim similar. So if you take the blue pill, that means you may be watching the show right now and you're gonna check out and you go watch some sports or whatever and go back to your regular life, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of repetitive because we repeat ourselves. Human beings have a tendency to repeat themselves every day. Or you can take the red pill, and that's what we um, involve our, ourselves in, and we'll take you down the rabbit hole and explore the truth, different truths for everybody. So that's really what I wanted to share with you today about what the show is about. Anybody wants to add anything? Uh, yeah, I can add something. Uh, I'd say this is an evolving process. I, I don't know that we are, I'm sure that we are not perfectly representing this. and. Um, to do this at all really quite is quite a feat in terms of really relating consciously in the moment to each other in the context of discussing uh, conscious based topics. <laughs> so um, we're, we're in an evolving process ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. All right, so if there's nothing else, then let's move on to our leading question, which I'm going to share something. You have something? Go ahead. Go ahead, Nina. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say I think that it's opened up a whole new channel for all of us of actually um, 
anticipating what's going to go on with living consciously and opening up ourselves with all our meetings and our actual team. And I think it's really opened us up and it's made us sort of, you know, understand other people rather than just wandering around in our own little world and sharing things with other people that we don't really know, but we're getting to know. And I think it's been a great experience, an experience to be continued. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So the leading question is for our guest, Jim. So here it goes. Why are most people lost and fully identified with the world and their circumstances operating on autopilot and simply reacting like mechanically to the world without stepping back and assessing the logic and the sanity of our thoughts and actions? But uh, the sound really dropped off. Yeah, Steve, you're very difficult okay, to hear. Okay, can we turn the audio up a little bit, please? All right. Uh, it's better. If you've asked the question, I can go ahead and start the answer. Or is that where we're at? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Let's go ahead. In, okay. in reality and, and within our consciousness, yes. Did you, did okay. you hear the question? Well, most of it, you were dropping off, but I think I have it. I can and, repeat uh, it if you like. Oh, go ahead. All right, so the question is, why are most people lost and fully identified with the world and their circumstances operating on an autopilot and simply reacting like mechanically to the world without stepping back and assessing the logic and sanity of our thoughts and actions? Right, well, for me, uh, looking at this, um, you know, we could start with the process of trying to, to get past this, but to, the question is, why does it happen? So I would say that the patterns that we have that we call reality and our personality, our ego, this started developing when we were very young as a, as a coping compensation for something that we weren't getting or a fear or a desire. And then it started growing and gaining force and and you know we could look at a little child two or three years old and they start developing their own personality and they're also developing their separateness and this is how we operate in the world and i imagine it's possible to go your whole lifetime and identify with the personality and the way you see through your map of reality or at some point you might start getting the idea that you're not that um, personality, that thing you've identified with, but you're much, much more than that. So I think that's what you're getting at, is how do we discover how to move into our larger identity? But why we have the smaller one, it's, uh, it, I would say it's the condition of how, how the, the human experience is built. And uh, now it's up to us to find our larger identity. Okay, so would you say, Jim, that by the time we're a teenager, we're pretty much done with in terms of um, our worldview and in terms of who we think we are and who we think um, how the world operates? Would you say that that's accurate? I think some of the, the core reasons of why we're locked in to that, uh, you might call it a false identity, happens much earlier than teenager, but yes, by the time we're teenagers, we're we're very definitely operating within that personality. Uh, you know, someone says, Jim, I turn and look, and I think that's who I am. And uh, then we have the rest of our lifetime to uh, to expand and move that identity to to more of our true self. Right. Now, how would our how would our viewers um, recognize um, their their own self? when they are an automatic pilot. And what do we really mean by being an automatic pilot? Would, would anybody like to share? I, I think it's, um, we always like to seem to go back to a safe place. So when Jim was talking about um, our childhood, it's funny how we blame everything, uh, uh, all our, not all of it, but most, of what goes on in our life to our childhood. And um, normally it's, we gravitate to not the good things, gravitate to the bad things that happen to us and I think if we try to um, 
look a little bit on the more positive side of the great things that happened to us as a childhood and not what this happened to us as a childhood and this is why I'm like I am now. So this is what we gravitate to. I call it a safe spot, which really is not a safe spot. It's a spot where it's sort of kind of a, a, a crutch where we can hang on to as to say that's how we are and that's why I am like I am because of when I was a child. I'd love to jump in, if I may. I've addressed this before, and, um, you know, for a long time in my work, I identified this idea of being on automatic pilot as a bad thing. And I think that's a mistake because we learn that we operate predominantly from our subconscious conditioning. That's not necessarily a bad thing that is technically our automatic pilot. It's just what are you conditioned with? Is it positive or is it predominantly negative? Well, and, and also I'd say that the issue yeah. is really what we're talking about is are you actually present in the here and now and, or are you not? And I agree with Alicia that certainly it's, it's, it, uh, people have to be functioning from an unconscious or automatic pilot a lot of the time or you couldn't function. There's, there's things that just happen automatically. But what we're talking, and it's an evolving process because I don't think there's anyone, unless you're just a totally enlightened master, who is really, we're talking about being present. That's the opposite of autopilot. And the reason people aren't present to whatever degree they're not is because of pain and fear. And the pain and fear isn't really about what happened to us as a child. It's about decisions that we made, interpretations of what happened when right. we are a child that gets locked in. So um, I'd say the first step is pe this isn't going to change for anyone unless they realize there's a problem. So people can go for years and years, feel perfectly happy being on autopilot or being not present in the here and now and not connected to who they are. And unless they perceive this as a problem, it won't change. But life has a way <laughs> of sort of bringing it to you um, when it's time for you to, to make some changes that this when it doesn't when it no longer works yeah but yes I agree. yes I agree except that except that people you know when people are not conscious they they will continuously because I remember I have continuously bump into things that are uncomfortable and that would trigger them and sometimes people can go through 10 20 30 years with these triggers, uh, destroy relationships, destroy, um, you know, families, and um, you know, still, <laughs> st still maybe not open um, to say that, hey, I've been married now three times. Uh, there has been, you know, a dozen women in my life, and um, the only thing common between those dozen women is me. <laughs> Well, a part of it is is the choice, like Jane said. A part of it is making the choice. Are you choosing to, uh, you know, just continue doing the same thing that you've always done and blame everybody else for your problems? When you don't take right. responsibility, you're not giving yourself the option to make those changes. But another right. part of the problem is how many people even know that there's a different option available. Most people well, don't, and if you surround yourself with people that yeah. are in the same frame of, of mind that you are, how are you going to break out of that, that pattern unless I, something is the catalyst for, for finding that? I totally agree with what, what Alicia said. The thing of, I think one of the most important things you said there is about blaming other people, and this is crucial because this is what projection, and if people have heard the term projection before is when you take the pain that's inside of yourself and you project it onto someone else and believe that they are causing the pain in you. That is probably one of the mo largest reasons why people keep doing this possibly for their whole lifetime if they are projecting their pain outside of themselves, blaming the way life is, the way men are, the way women's are, women are, the economy or whatever. You can stay stuck there forever. <laughs> Can I, uh, yeah, let, let, so I can learn how this works, uh, let me jump in. You don't in. need to ask for permission. Okay. Just jump okay. right in. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, now I'm agreeing with everything that's being said, uh, but I want to add it doesn't have to be problem-based or derived. There, there, It depends on each one of our makeup, and if we're going to get to the point where we're talking about our true identity that operates and manifests into this limited self, um, for some, it can just be a process of exploration 
and uh, a desire okay. for uh, uh, more discovery. So Absolutely. yes, we, we might fall into it through pain. We might uh, discover it in an entirely different way. I mean, we might be in a cultural group, a family, a community that uh, encourages us to, to find a spiritual center, for instance, and that might start the, uh, the, the search for the larger identity. So yes, it can be problems, but it can be a number of things that get us started, but then it's the process of differentiating between what we're observing and who we are, uh, we might say as the observer, particularly as that expands into more of a essential nature. Right, and I want to make sure, Jim, that we don't get into the solutions too soon. I so won't talk about the solutions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's explore what the issues and the problems are okay. with being an automatic pilot, because um, you know, that's, that's how we are attempting to, to have our viewers um, maybe hear something that they can identify with. And, right, uh, well, can, let me go ahead and say then, now that I understand what you're saying here, just imagine the emotional energy that keeps cropping up that locks us into pattern reactions that we're throughout the day just constantly reacting and the energy that goes with the, the self-talk that uh, is going on all the time. They did this, I did that, I want this, I'm afraid this is going to happen. There's an emotional energy that fuels all those reactive patterns. and. Um, I imagine later in the show we'll talk about uh, how, how we get past that. Absolutely. But, there, but it's a whole ball of wax. It's the thoughts, it's the emotions, it's the patterns that we're locked into. Okay, so I'm going to go out on the limb and say, say that every human being, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong here, has some kind of a trauma early in life when we are little kids. And it's associated with the time where we lose our innocence. Does anybody on the, on the cast, and Jim, do you, remember, do you remember when you were a little kid and you were innocent and you had no fear and you just, you just were incredibly beautiful and magnificent and full of light and full of love? <laughs> and you know, I have a you, sense of it and I can sort of imagine it, but it's mostly through my, my study of what might have got me to where I am or what, how I broke away from that innocence that I can most recreate it. But yes, it's a very lovely thought to remember our innocence. Yeah, so is it possible that when we are little kids, and, and is it possible that this, this happens to all human beings, um, some of us may are not recognizing it because we don't want to, we, we want to resist it, but is it possible that every human being goes through something uh, in their early life, probably between the age of two and two and five, where something happens in their lives that they cannot explain why it hurts so much. There's no way. We, we have not taught the child yet how to blame the parents, how to, how to blame the outside world. We, we kind of take it on on our, on our own and say it's us. And that's when we that's when we make a judgment of ourselves, and that's when we lose this purity that we were talking about earlier. Steve, yeah. um, I want to say something about the way you've just described it, because I, don't descri I wouldn't describe it quite like that. I don't think it's an issue of people teaching you how to blame other people. Um, first, what happens is that something occurs that you can't make sense of the way you were saying. That's sort of a jolt that you don't have the conscious tools to make Something sense of it. Something happens to you, that, that it hurts so much that you... But it's not what happens, it's the interpretation that you made of it yes. based on yes. the limit. Yes, so the and pain then, the pain is there and then and you have to you, explain right, it. You are usually blaming yourself. Yes, yes. Usually. and the way you explain it is, you know, I am no good, um, right. I, uh, you know, I am a whore, I am, and I can go on, you know, with a with a long list of what right. people can make up. And then, is it, is, it, is it true or is it accurate that then, or I'm a nobody, which is mine, by the way. And then, is it true that we go through life then to prove to the world and to ourselves that we are not the judgment that we made of ourselves in this right. huge hurt? That's the emotional defense system. So, that's, so, that's what keeps us on auto, autopilot, is right. when you make the decision, it is so utterly painful 
that it's nearly impossible to stay conscious in the here and now at the same time believing that it's true, which limiting decisions never are. But so it's because it feel, it's so painful that we have to avoid here and now, um, and then what we do to avoid here and now to, to avoid the pain, that's where projection, projecting our pain and blaming other people comes in. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I agree. Because because then we go through life then um, between the, the two ends of this phenomenon, which is, in my case, if I'm a nobody, it's from nobody to being somebody. So our, our life and our purpose becomes to prove to the world that I am somebody, at the same time believing underneath that that I'm a nobody. So anytime I go through life and I interact with other people, and they're going to make me feel like that I'm a nobody, I'm, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to go crazy. I think that's one, one way that people react. Another way that people react is they, they accept it. They take it on as their identity, that I'm a nobody, right. and they stay small. So there's a couple right. different ways that people, Absolutely. people um, you know, internalize that. Yeah. Fantastic. It's funny Great. how we all seem to think um, we're all on the negative side of how how we think of all the bad things we are. And as you said, you feel very insignificant, um, Steve. And it's like when you say that I can't do that, I guarantee you won't be able to do it because you're planting that seed. And when you say you, you can do something and you have that enthusiasm, normally you can do it. So I think it's a, a matter of, of trying to get into yourself of that nobody else is any better than you are. We are all the same. But just having that encouragement, thinking of more of the negative, uh, thinking more of the positive side of life than the negative. That listening to all your conversations is all sort of very, very negative of, they, of how bad I am, how I'm not this and I'm not that. And okay, Nina, let me let me start. remind you that I was describing myself when I was five years old. I know. At, at five it, years old, I do not have a concept of what what's positive and what's negative. I don't. Well, that's true. That's true too. But you have chosen now to look at it as a negative side. Um, well, I am I bringing this up as an example. You know, and I think what we're describing is for, for the viewers. there's a difference between what the conscious mind and the unconscious mind is doing. And the, the limiting decision that you're bad or don't exist or whatever is locked into the unconscious mind. That's where it needs to change. So certainly it's helpful to, to, to use empowering words. But if, I think beating, that, if you keep beating yourself up, you're, you're always going to stay that's, there. I don't think that's what Steve is doing. He's describing, and I think that's part of how you come into the present moment and how you start moving into who you really are, is to acknowledge what your unconscious mind is doing. It's funny we're talking um, about when you were kids, and, and I just saw it. there's a little kid I happen to know, and about three or four weeks ago, she was great, she was laughing, she had a personality. Something happened at her school, and she is a completely different person now. She's very right. quiet, she's very shy. You and I don't know what happened. Nobody knows what happened. Nobody's saying anything. But something, like you were saying, Steve, something happened to her in that school and just changed her completely. And this does happen when you're a child. Yeah, and that's, that's the only thing that we were trying to um, or attempting yeah. to uh, show to our viewers that, you know, this is just one example. And there are, you know, millions of examples of people doing this in, in, in many different forms. Uh, for, for example, when... When I, when I go into a gym, which I haven't been in lately, but I remember <laughs> still, <laughs> still when I when I went into a gym and when I see all these buff guys, you know, absolutely, you know, built to the hilt, what comes to my mind immediately is weak, because they're compensating, they're possibly compensating for being really weak by becoming very strong. Also, you may relate to this, Ninon, <coughs> is that all these beautiful, pretty women on Cosmopolitan, on, on the cover of the magazine, would you believe that if you interviewed all those people, you would hear from most of them that they feel that they are ugly? And as far as I can, I'm oh, concerned, I they're the that. most beautiful I women on the planet. I agree with that 100%. I agree with that because I've been through that myself because I don't think I am what I am, what people say, and I absolutely agree with you 100%. But a majority of these women that are from Cosmopolitan look nothing like that when you see them in person. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Time is okay. right. Time. So that, so Well, I didn't, really have, I didn't have my makeup you... artist here today, so this is what you get. I think this is a really good example. What Nina is saying is a really good example of the way you described it, Steve. So a person makes a limiting decision that they're ugly or they're not valuable or whatever, 
And instead of going deeper into it and getting to the bottom of it into the present moment where you find out that it's not true, um, they're compensating for it. So now their whole life, instead of living their life directly, Fully. they're focused in yeah. co compensating for the limiting decisions. So, so now being beautiful or being buff or being everything, uh, whatever that is, is everything to them. And that is auto autopilot. Right. So, you know, so that, you're right because a lot of actresses. The reason a lot of actors and actresses are out there is because they don't believe in themselves, and they can portray somebody else when they do the acting. They are one of the most insecure people in the world as actors and actors, actresses, because they don't believe who they are. But so, in that case, just saying something like "I love myself," "I believe myself," etc., cetera, etc., cetera, until you get down to the bottom of how you really feel about yourself, saying those things just separates you even further from yourself. Right. If you don't believe it, it means virtually nothing. In fact, it might actually have the counter effect because it, it's just like somebody somebody telling you, um, you know, you're skinny, you're skinny, you're skinny when you're 300 pounds, you know, all it's doing is reinforcing the <sighs> negative feelings and beliefs that you already have. It, it almost makes it it worse when we lie to ourselves, when we tell ourselves something that we don't believe. So, I mean, that's that's a very important distinction. I think a lot of people are, you know, it, I I always pause when I catch myself saying something that I know is going to piss some people off. But so anyway, it's okay. We're on cable TV. <laughs> We're on cable TV. We can there's, piss some people off. There's so many people out there that got on the bandwagon with all of these positive affirmations. And now I'm not saying that there's anything wrong inherently with reinforcing and conditioning ourselves with, with what we want and our goals. But if you're telling yourself, you know, I'm skinny, I'm skinny, I'm skinny, and every time you say that to yourself, there's another part of voice in your mind saying, no, you're not. You know, liar, you lose, that is, is a total disservice to any Can real you... positive transformation that you have the potential to make. I think you're so right because it's funny how um, when people are overweight, they, they sort of deny it all the time. They really know they're overweight, but they deny it all the time. I'm fine. I'm great. Everything's fine. But they really wander around with this inner feeling of feeling so insecure with themselves. And as you say, they're lying to themselves and not being honest. And by saying, you know, I'm skinny. Mm -hmm. And they're not. And, and I have a prize example right now. I have a woman that weighs 475 pounds. And I can't get her to go on a diet or to help herself. It's sad. Right on. All right, Jim, are you with us? No, he's not. Yeah, I think he dropped off. So our um, technical people will try to get him back on online. So all right. So I also wanted to say something about when we, when we do this uh, in terms of a core issue. Uh, creating a core issue that, and, and I know that um, Jane refers to it as a limiting belief, and it's, it's accurate. Um, but if you look at the world and what's possible in your life, you know, a anything is possible. But when we make, um, we make this decision or, or, or we create this identity of ourselves, like in my case that I'm a nobody, um, what, what ends up happening is instead of, instead of having the entire pie, the, 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 the whole enchilada, we, we slice out a piece and we see the world only from that limited piece, which is, for me, it was nobody and somebody. Does, does that make sense? No, what are you, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, it, so... That you've, you've already, you've cut out this piece of pie, and that's all you want, and that's all who you are going to be. Instead of saying that, yes, I could have the whole pie. And it's just a matter of you getting the security of yourself. I, I you believe... I, the whole I, pie. Yeah, Nina, and I believe that for people, their core issue becomes like an obsession, because, because they want to prove to the world and to themselves that they are not their core issue. And underneath right. that, believing that they are. So it's, a, it's like having the carrot in front of you and just creating a list, creating a list throughout your entire life that you're going to do. And I can give you my own examples, which is, yeah, I got to become a corporate uh, guru. I want the VP, vice president of, uh, 
a position in a corner office. I want the beautiful house. I want the beautiful wife. I got a, the picket fence, the several cars, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on. And guess what? I did all that. Are you happy? Because I was driven by this core issue to prove to the world and to myself that I am somebody. And, and to, to the outside viewer, oops, <laughs> what did just happen? Hi, Jim. Hi there. Yeah, I think we lost you. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is what happens when we don't have a group. Okay. So, sorry about that. So you're going to add them back, each one, one at a time. Oh, boy. All right. So, uh, Jim, we were talking about, um, while you dropped off, we were talking about this, um, this pie that, that, that really what's possible in, in, in the world for people is there's no limit. It's, it's like there's this huge pie, just envision the huge pie. And when we, when we create this core issue within ourselves, which is um, something that I believe everybody, everybody has done, we, we actually just take the slice of that pie and uh, live our lives, a limited life, from that slice. So in my example, um, when I was talking about nobody and somebody, um, I'm basically viewing the world uh, from, from that, you might say, sunglass, which is the color of the sunglass is the left end is somebody, the right end is nobody. And that's all I really see in the world. And I'm driven to become somebody. Okay, so in my case, um, I um, certainly have become somebody <laughs> because I was so driven to, su to success. You know, I, I, I started my own businesses. I was a consultant, uh, a big five, several big five consulting firms I worked for. I became a vice president. Um, the list goes on. I got the picket fence, the beautiful house, the, the beautiful wife, the kids, the cars, all of that. Okay, because I was very much driven to prove to the world that I was somebody. But underneath that, I have always believed that I was a nobody still and that there's still a lot more things. Like I had this carrot in front of me that there's all these things that I still have to accomplish in order to become somebody. And every time I got to the bottom of the list, um, I turned the page over and started a new list. It was a never-ending process. And this, this happened until... 15 years ago, when I all of a sudden, it became clear to me that, wait a minute, <laughs> this is insane. Jim, what do, you, what do you think about that? What do you hear? Very definitely. I think um, that's what uh, we're saying is that each one of us develops um, a model or a way of fulfilling the void you know, or stopping the pain or whatever it might be that we were talking about. But there's this drive to finally get comfortable and feel like we have security and that we're getting what we want. Like we want, we want, want, want a lot and definitely want, want to fulfill the, uh, the basic security. And in your case and in many people's case, uh, to, to become somebody. Uh, each one of us has our own story of what that might be. And that's what makes it so difficult because of this drive this built into the human condition to to finally get comfortable and protected and safe and satisfied that the process of unraveling that to get to our larger self, we, we have to be willing to then um, let go of what we built up. E e no matter w the, the characteristics that are involved in it, um, th we have constructed the best we can do to 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 live comfortably and safely and then the journey begins i was asking jim and instead of uh, since he's not on i'll just ask you you the cast so so do you think uh, that in people's lives uh, there are some 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 specific uh, special times when they are more open and more motivated to find the real you yeah Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And what are those times? 
Well, you, you, you just demonstrated it yourself. You said you went down, full-fledged down a particular path um, trying to compensate for feeling like a nobody, and you sort of reached the end of the path, and then you realized that it wasn't really giving you what you wanted, that you ended up being empty and losing everything. So that jolted you into uh, facing yourself, basically. <laughs> you had nowhere else to go. So that's, that's one way, um, at, and that you could say occurred for me. I would, was in a spiritual community for 22 years, and, and it, certainly it was a process of self-discovery, but it was also very dysfunctional. And I had to go to the end of that path um, to realize that it was the wrong path for me. Um, but the thing is that, that you learn, when you go down a wrong path, you're also learning a lot. Oh, I, so I learned a tremendous amount. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, in, Me in the process, of, uh, in the process of pushing myself to become somebody, I learned a lot of skills that yeah. I, I, am, I, I am benefiting from go. right now. Yeah, yeah, so there are right. mistakes where you go. I mean, you go down paths you think is the wrong path, but maybe sometimes that might be the right one, and the other one was the wrong one. So sometimes you can have a great experience and enjoy it rather than saying, oh, aren't I stupid? This is crazy. I should be doing this. Enjoy that, that sort of change that suddenly happened and, and, and take it in. But you'll go, I want you to go back on funny how some days you feel a little bit sort of you know depressed or you don't feel exactly with it 100%, and then the next day, you wake up and you feel so fine and so wonderful and just want to go out there and get it and do it and everything else. So I often wonder why that happens, such a transitional time in such a short yeah. time. Well, that's it's a very good question. And I think that what it shows is there's something larger at play than our, our individual perception of what's of reality. Is that we're not the only person, uh, at the only factor at play in our life. There's a larger reality beyond beyond the individual consciousness that is also in there guiding you and supporting you and protecting you and, and uh, giving you experiences that are important to you on a soul level. So there's a combination of things happening. There's Oh, Jane, you're so right. You are so right on that. And we, we, we seem to cut ourselves off of not being able to explore, saying, well, you know, I won't do it. But there's so much that you can do out there. And it's funny, when you do do something totally out of your realm and you succeed at it, how great you feel. And then you turn around and say, well, I wouldn't really, I don't know how I did that, but I really like the experience. So hopefully that would make you go for another experience and like sort of t not testing yourself, but trying to go out there and realize that you are, you can, there's so much more in your body you can do than we realize. Right. Are there any other tools that uh, that the cast may may have to share with our viewers? Uh, how to get to the real you? Yeah, I'd say one of the the things that gets in the way of people coming into into who they really are is um, avoiding pain, avoiding what it, what they are afraid is true. Um, and that's what so if you and avoiding what they are really feeling and avoiding what really matters to them, all of those things can bring you into the present moment and lead forward deeper. That's the difference between going deeper and skating on the surface and avoiding. Right, and what, how do people avoid the pain? By addiction kinds of things, which could mm. be relationships, it could be food, it could be alcohol or whatever. Anything that uh, uh, gives you a momentary satisfaction that keeps you from being present to what really matters to you. Um, actually, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the question, the question was, uh, <laughs> was you were referring to people, um, people avoiding, actually it's avoiding the truth, isn't it? It's avoiding, yeah, what they're afraid is true. Yeah. And, so, I mean, there is, there, and, and I disagree with you about the whole issue of truth, and we'll have to have a discussion about this one. one. Yeah, okay, we can. So, so here's what I realized, so I'm just going to share true. that, I'm just going to share with you what I realized, okay? So, so when I had this experience, and I'm not going to describe the experience right now, why I made that decision that I was a nobody, because we don't have the time. Maybe some other time we'll do it. But, um, but what, I, what I learned about that is that I, I made the I am a nobody, um, and I, I bought it. I bought that whole notion, hook, line, and sinker, and that's who I become at that time. And all I can tell you today, what I'm realizing is I was a nobody 
just in a time and space at that time when that pain has occurred. But I made it to be about my life. And that's, that was an error in, in, in the way I, I dealt with it. But I believe since we didn't have the tools when we were little kids, no, nobody has the tools back then to deal with it any other way. So it's kind of a human condition. And, and today, I recognize that there is a part of me that's a nobody. But you know what? It's OK. Well, get rid yeah. of that part. Get rid of that part oh, that no, you're a nobody. That. You are somebody, and you've no. got to No, there, there's being. nothing to get rid of, because, yeah. because somebody doesn't exist without nobody. I, so, I agree with you, Steve, and I think that there is a very important part of your personality that, that shines through, that sort of, sort of humble. And one way you, perhaps you could describe it, um, if you, if you uh, believe in past lifetimes, is it may be a compensation for extreme arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see that as a possible avenue that you could go in, and maybe that you did go in in some other earlier part of your I life. I certainly have. But there's a part of you that's really humble that I feel very moved by that it doesn't sort of insert, assert your personality, but it's sort of very present. And you could, you could describe that as, as a nobody, but it's, it's, it's actually, it's really a somebody, but it, it's hugely a somebody. Well, but it's not, in, but it's not in, in uh, ego terms. It's not in terms of, of what, th I, can't, I can't think of how to describe it, what's generally thought of or I don't know. It's it's sort of a, a presence rather than an imposing. A, a, I can't think of how to describe it. Maybe Alicia, maybe well, you could describe <laughs> it. I'm so you know what I what I would say about what Steve is saying is that if you hear the tone of his voice as he describes it, he's come to peace with this. It's really not an issue, and I think that as we, it's a matter of what we're identifying with. And yeah. we can spend a lot of time analyzing how it happened when we were two or three and what it all means, but we need to move our identity more into the larger one. And when we're more established there, we can be at peace with whatever we uncover. And also Absolutely. to uncover it, we have to let it come into our consciousness. We have to allow the emotional content to be there. We have to feel it, and then we have to let go of it. So Absolutely. when I hear Steve say that, I don't see a problem at all. Uh, okay. it's, just a, it's just a characteristic. And now he's moved on. And I bet you each one of us has something similar to describe in, in our own uh, progress. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Jim. I completely agree. It, it's, um, identify, it's, it's letting go of, of the false description of oneself as if it really yes. could change who you actually are. You know, Letting so go you, of the false description, yes, Exactly, yes. so making the decision that you're nobody is not in truth. It has nothing to do with truth. It's completely made up fabrication. Absolutely. And so, yeah. you know, so you know, let yourself say that. So what? Who cares? Right. It doesn't right. have anything to do with truth. Right. The way, if you heard Steve's way of saying it, he's moved on. He, it's easy for him to say that now. But imagine yeah. for, uh, how a person would sound if they really believed it. They'd be oh, in yeah. pain. Yeah. There is sorrow. Guilt, everything. Well, they'd probably never yes. say it. They'd never admit it. They would never yeah, say it. Yeah, they wouldn't even bring it out. Right. No, they would. They would carry right. it around with them. That's right. Yeah, that's no need. that's yeah. right on, Ninon. That's right on. Yeah, people actually resist it so much that um, at all costs they will they well, will why? do whatever they have to do so that they don't have to feel it. Yeah. And that's that's really where the solution is. Are, are you avoiding what you really feel? Are you going the other direction? Are you trying to compensate for it? Or are you looking at it square in the face? Because when you look at it square in the face, you find out that it's not true. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, has anybody ever, you know, when you don't want to see somebody and you're walking along the street and you want to avoid them, so you cross over the street so you don't have to say hello? How many of us have done that? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, Whoops, I don't want to see that person. Right. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, and so, we do that with ourselves. So oh, I don't want to look at that part of me. Yeah. So I, I, I think though it's okay though if we do it with other people if it's for for our highest good. It's well, not, it's not so much okay when we do it with so ourselves. Okay. <laughs> I've done that a few times. So all right, guys. I, so actually, that's all the time we have um, have today. So uh, many thanks to all of our viewers and uh, of course our guest uh, Jim and. Uh, the entire cast and the crew, and don't forget to vote on our shows.
uh, by going to uh, www.livingconsciously.tv and also comment uh, on our shows as well and join our uh, free membership site um, at the same site. So um, when you vote, the more you vote, the more our uh, shows are actually shown on Comcast, channel 56, 57, and 219. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to our next show uh, next Saturday, always at the same time, 3 p.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. Eastern. I love you all. Mm -hmm.